Okay, let's begin with a prayer. Stand. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. God bless and welcome catechumens. Uh, thank you for choosing again Eastern Orthodox Christian faith. So to be clear, I'm an archpriest. So they would say the very reverend Father Paul Baba, but I'm just Father Paul to you. Uh, but we have the cross that I wear is the crown. They say archpriest, and the bottom is the tear that a priest goes through. Sometimes they cry on your behalf. You hear all the confessions of the church, and it's a lot. It's a lot on a priest. So uh, we're with you in prayers and like that. Um, Eastern Orthodox Christian Church is called Holy Apostolic Catholic Orthodox Church. It's not meaning Catholic as in the Roman Catholic. Catholic means universal. So in the beginning, when Christ, the founder of the church, began and taught his disciples for three years, meaning students, apostles means sent out ones. So he had 12 disciples and he taught them. And there came 70 apostles all together. Apostles of the 70, but they all received from Jesus Christ the one true church, the one teaching, even a service liturgy that the brother of our Lord, James, the first patriarch of Jerusalem, has started in Jerusalem. And we still have that liturgy. It's done twice a year, St. James Liturgy. They had a baptismal. And at that time, they used to confess, because the Bible says to confess to one another. See the teachings? We follow the teachings of the Bible. And he would have them stand up here and confess to the whole congregation. That became a little rough, especially when people never heard of certain sins and they got more ideas. But uh, so they went on to the side, the church apostles' fathers decided, let's go to the side. And you would have a traditional Bible and a cross. The priest wears his stole. It's the epitrahelion. The stole means epitra, patra, rock, Peter, the rock. The demons cannot penetrate through this. So when you have confession, I put it over you, and now you're guarded and protected by God, and you confess your sins to Christ, you see. That's how they did it back then, and the priest was a witness. You're not confessing to the priest, but to Jesus Christ and himself, and it's in the gospel. The priest has the grace by the apostolic succession, laying down of hands from bishop to the priest, the bishop to the priest, from the patriarch of Antioch as they did it from the Apostles' time, we are linked up with this. And they had the grace, unworthy though a priest may be, to give absolution or to retain the sins. If you committed a, a sin, let's say a murder, then the priest would say you need penance. Penance isn't a torment or a torture or a punishment. It's an act of love to help you to reassure, make sure that you are truly, deeply uh, repenting uh, with great understanding that it was very offensive against God. And then there's the canon law that tells you certain times you go through a period of time of penance, or uh, in our days it's a little difficult to fulfill the heavy penance, so we try to maybe lessen that, but to make sure that your heart understands the, uh, the deed that was not pleasing to God and you repent of. See? So the church is here to help you get to heaven. We're not your enemy. So I have uh, something to read to you first, and then I have uh, three little pages of uh, church ethics that I think will be very important here. But first, I'd like to share with you in this great big book. It's called The Orthodox Patristic Witness Concerning Catholicism and Orthodox Ethos Publication. This is a kindly gifted book to me from Father Peter Hears. And this great book, book is filled with Holy Father's teachings on other religions and who we are as Orthodox, true Orthodox faith. And we receive from our modern fathers, our ancient fathers of the church, and we accept it. Where would we be without divinely inspired fathers? Father Seven Rose, who do we have to turn to? They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, guided by Christ, the Holy Church, and defended the Church. 
So it says, <clears throat> Those of us, by the grace of God, have been raised with dogma of piety, and who follow in everything one holy Catholic and apostolic church believe that the, role path, the sole path to salvation of mankind is the faith in the Holy Trinity, the work and the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, and their continuance within his body, the Holy Church. Christ is the only true light. There are no other lights to illumine us, nor any other names that can save us. Neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other than under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. All other beliefs, all religions that ignore do not confess Christ having come in the flesh are human creations and works of the evil one which do not lead to the true knowledge of God and the rebirth through the divine baptism but instead mislead men and lead them to perdition. As Christians who believe in the Holy Trinity we do not have the same God as any other religions, nor with the so-called monotheistic religions, Judaism, Mohammedism, when I say Mohammedanism, which do not believe in the Holy Trinity. For 2,000 years, the one church which Christ founded and the Holy Spirit has guided has remained stable and unshakable in the Salvific, Salvific Truth that was taught by Christ, delivered by the Holy Apostles, and preserved by the Holy Fathers. She did not buckle under the cruel persecutions by the Judeans, initially, or by idolaters later, during the first three centuries. She has brought forth a host of martyrs, and emerged victoriously, thus proving, uh, proving her divine origin. St. John the Chrysostom Beautifully expressed it. Nothing is stronger than the church. If you fight against a man, you either conquer or are conquered. But if you fight against the church, it is not possible for you to win. For God is strongest of all. Following the cessation of the persecution and the triumph of church over her external enemies, in other words, the Judeans and idolaters, the eternal enemies of the church, began to multiply and strengthen. A variety of heresies began to appear, which endeavored to overthrow the adulterate, and faith, once delivered, such the faithful become confused, and their trust in the church of the gospel and traditions will be uh, debilitated. An outline the celestial state of affairs was created by the dominance for over 40 years, and administratively, the fathers had been uh, administratively of the heresies of Arius. St. Basil the Great says, the dogmas of the fathers have been entirely disregarded, the apostolic traditions withered, the inventions of the youth are absurd, in the churches, people are now logic chopping, non theologizing. Presidents is given to the wisdom of the world, pushing aside the boasting in the cross. Shepherds are driven out, and in their place, cruel wolves are ushered in, dispersing Christ's flock. That which happened because of eternal enemies, external enemies, excuse me, religions, has also happened because of of internal ones, heresies. The Church, through her great and enlightened Holy Fathers, demarcated, demarcated and marked the boundaries of the Orthodox faith with dilute decisions by local and ecumenical synods in cases of specific dubious teachings, but also with the agreement of the Fathers on all other matters of the faith. We stand on sure ground when we follow the Holy Fathers, and do not move the boundaries that which had been set. Expressions following after the Holy Fathers and not withdrawing boundaries that our fathers have set are signposts for a steady course of spiritual advance and a guardrail for remaining within the Orthodox faith and way of life. 
Consequently, the basic positions of our confession are the followings. One, we, re we maintain irremovable and without alteration everything that the synods of the fathers have instructed, have instituted. We accept everything that they accept and condemn everything that they condemn. And we avoid communications with those who innovate in matters of the faith, we neither add nor remove nor alter any teaching, even from the apostolic era. The God-bearing St. Ignatius of Antioch, in his epistle to St. Polycarp of Smyrna, and wrote, Anyone who says contrary to what has been decreed, even if it is trustworthy, even if it fasts, even if he fasts, even if he lives in virginity, even if he performs signs and prophesies, let him appear to you as a wolf and sheep hide, aspiring to be to the corruption of the sheep. St. John Chrysostom, interpreting the Apostle Paul's words, If any man preach any gospel, any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be anathema, cursed, out of the church. You'll find that in Galatians 1. Observes that the Apostle did not say if they proclaim something contrary, or if they should overturn everything, but that even if they should preach even the smallest thing that has not been delivered to you, if they should simply provoke it, let them be anathema. Upon announcing its decisions against the iconoclasts to the clergy of Constantinople, iconoclasts, those who are attacking Orthodox iconography, the Seventh Ecumenical Council of Synod wrote, We have followed the traditions of the Catholic Church, neither loosing the matters of faith nor making a superfluous uh, addition, but had been taught in the apostolic manner to we maintain the traditions we have received, accepting and respecting everything that the Holy Catholic Church has received from the first years, unwritten and written, for the true straightforward judgment of the Church does not make an allowance for innovations within her, and for attempts to remove anything. We, therefore, by following the laws of the Fathers, have received grace by one Spirit, and duly safeguarded without any innovations and reductions of all things of the Church. Along with the Holy Fathers and Synons, we too reject the anathematize all the heresies that appeared during the historical course of the Church. Of all old heresies that have survived to this day, we condemn Arianism, who spoke against Holy Trinity, these are modern day Jehovah's Witness, still serving, still surviving, and pseudo witness of Jehovah's Witness tells you that, and monotheism, the extreme of the Eftichios, and the more moderate from the uh, severest of discourse. According to the decisions of the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chaldea, the Christological teaching of great fathers and teachers, the saints, Maximus Confessor, John Damascus, Photius the Great, and the hymns of one our worship. And I'll end with this paragraph. We proclaim the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholicism is a womb of heresies and fallacies, the teaching of the philoque, which is against the Holy Trinity. That is the procession and the Holy Spirit and from the Son. It is contrary to everything that Christ himself taught about the Holy Spirit. The entire course of fathers, both in synods and individually, regard Roman Catholicism as a heresy because, apart from the philoque, it produced a host of other uh, fallacies such as primacy, uh, primacy and the infallibility of the Pope and unleavened bread, the host, and fires of purgatory, the immaculate conception of the Theotokos, Created grace, the purchase of absolution, purchasing of absolution, indulgences. It has altered nearly all the teaching and practice pertaining to baptism, chrismation, the divine Eucharist, and other sacraments, and has converted the church to a secular state. So, there are books, apologetics, and other religions. It goes deep into, and it's painful to read, it goes deep into the face and how they came about. We just heard the ecumenism, uh, the, ec uh, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, where the West, which was at the time, coming up with uh, types of different teachings, 
and the Holy Fathers of the East said, we must have a council. We must gather together and have a council. You're going off with different certain teachings. And they brought them forth, and then they changed the view on the Holy Trinity. And as you heard, a few others. And they anathematized them. St. Mark of Ephesus said, you must be on your way. Then. We will not follow you. The Roman Catholics are mad at St. Mark of Ephesus. One guy got in the way. We could all be in unity. What's the purpose of unity if you're not in Christ? And the changes that they made. And even uh, 100 years after that, the Pope was created. The whole idea of him sitting on the throne. And so it's Jesus himself speaking. Now the Pope is saying there's no hell. It's the latest thing from him. There's no hell. We have no enemies, no warfare against our souls. Who are we battling against? So, in Orthodoxy, we follow the Holy Fathers, we listen to the Holy Fathers, we don't change and divert from the Holy Fathers, we don't have special ideas, we're not special people more, we're, 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 uh, we have more better relationships with heretics than they did, so we feel we can uh, uh, more communicate better with them and unite them. And that's what they want to do. So we have, uh, it goes on to say that we're not against uh, the sinners, we're against the heresies. And we want unity of all men. We pray for it in the liturgy. But when you have to sell out of the faith, when you have to compromise, in order for it to happen, then it's a sellout, and it's no longer orthodox uh, teachings, and it's not bound up with the Holy Fathers and hosts the Holy Church. So, any questions on that so far? So, the Holy Trinity was changed by the Roman Catholics, the West. It was the first thing that happened, at least from the second, a thousand years ago. But you heard Arianism, Arian, uh, Arius, he changed the view of the Holy Trinity first, and then we have Monophysites, the one nature of Christ, not two. And then we have Nestor, who changed the same, actually wrote hymns that she was not the mother of God, but the mother of Christ. And you can say she's the mother of Christ, Christ is the anointed one. But it's more clear if we say she's the mother of God, that uh, Jesus is God. I and the Father are one. We talked about even if an angel of light appears to you, or a great saint, whatever it may be, man of prayer and fasting, has done great signs. Well, we heard that Muhammad received his religion from an angel. There's an angel of light. And he taught Muhammad a different gospel. And Muhammad followed that. And we don't accept that. He didn't test the Holy the angel. If you do the Lord's Prayer and deliver the evil one, they flee. But he didn't do anything. And he heard another religion, uh, another scripture. And of course the Quran is filled with many things. They believe Jesus is just a prophet. And the Virgin Mary is the mother of a prophet. But they don't believe that he's the son of God. And they don't believe he is God. So they do not know God the Father, as Christ says, but through me, but by me. So you, you have to have the Holy Trinity, as you heard in this book. Do the Catholics have the Holy Trinity the way we do? They do not. They do not. Do we judge them to hell? No, we don't. Do we say they have the grace as the Orthodox Church? They don't. I'm going to stand firm with the Holy Fathers. This can we read all the Holy Fathers you want. They will say, stand your guard. This is one church, one teaching, one doctrine. The Roman Catholic Church now has, a, according to St. Nectarios, at this time, in 1920, 144, 144 changes that were made from the West of Roman Catholicism to Orthodoxy. They believe that the Holy Spirit moved them to change. Luther came around. He didn't like Maccabees. He didn't like other books of the Bible because they opposed his view. So he took them out. These are the Lutherans. The Methodists said, we have another method, an idea. The Protestants protested Protestants against the Roman Catholic Church. All the old saints and the incense and all that stuff. This is the new day now. Jesus is with us. And all these crazy cockamamie uh, new religions but we didn't change. And you heard how they fought the good fight and remained faithful. 
So you can go and see other religions and see what they're doing. But you know that they're empty, and that's probably why you're here. They don't have communion the way we do. They do grape juice. They don't have bread that rises like Christ raised from the dead. They're flat bread. Leavened bread. They don't have confession the way we do. It's in a booth. The whole purpose of confession is one-on-one. -on -one, is to have the humility. To have the spiritual father know who you are. Not hide behind a curtain. But to can talk with you and see you. And to work with you and help you along. These are why we stick to the plan. And it's very uh, effective. Very fruitful. It helps us in every category better than any other religion to the kingdom of heaven. The Protestants say, evangelicals, we're saved. It says, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're saved if you believe in Him. Yes, that's true. You believe in Him, you'll be saved. But there's work to do. There's faith to acquire. Faith without works is dead. But they say you have to still repent. Ah, so you're saying you have to repent to be saved in the Protestant Church. Well, yeah, but, but what happens if I don't repent? That I still believe in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Well, you're not saved. Oh, so I'm not saved. So what are you saying? There's repentance, but they don't want to make it so heavy and known to where it becomes almost orthodox teaching. Okay, I have a list here of about, oh, 20 things, yeah, 20 things for you catechumens to know on Orthodox Christian ethics when attending church. If you have any questions on this, I'm sure you will, maybe. Please feel free. One, no cell phones. Two, no chewing gum. Three, no breakfast Sunday morning, whether you have a community or not. That's the rule. Mothers that are pregnant, have all you want. And don't pray and fast. Don't you go pray, but don't fast. You have to do prostrations and bows. Right? And sit down the whole you your feet. This is from the Holy Fathers. That's why some people want to keep having children. <laughs> Talk to a few like that. So no breakfast, that means no drinks. No baseball hats, no types of hats. No short sleeve shirts, shorts. Number seven, completely uh, must be co covered. No arms, no knees, no shoulders, you know, all that. Covered. Women to wear head scarves best you can in church. I'm not going to hold that to you. But it's best. Even the angels of the church, when they were in church, told saints it's very difficult for us to gaze upon a woman in church without a head covering. And the Bible knows that a woman who preaches in, in the church without a headscarf knows that it's done in vain. Uh, so women to wear headscarves, the tradition. Nine. Can't read my writing. Uh, so again, they must wear long skirts best they can for the church. Ten, lipstick that's at least wet is forbidden when you kiss an icon. If not at all. Men, you shouldn't be wearing cologne and the whole church is reaped up, but you can hang in there. But yeah, I'm going to tell women. Eleven, clothes without logos. You don't want to see go 49ers. I want to think of the 49ers during communion. Right, Eric? Not that Eric wore that shirt. Uh, no sloppy outfits with holes in your pants. We all agree on that a little bit. Church is, you know, it's not a fashion statement here, right? It's not a nightclub. And we don't need an old yaya, no gum. You have a hole in your I sold them for you. They'll come up and embarrass you. I'm warning you. <laughs> Twelve. No talking or shaking hands in the narthex, the entrance, or the church, the body. To the whole service, and when you leave. Can you imagine the church? Thirteen, do not be late for services. Fourteen, do not leave church before dismissal. 
There's an angel in church who writes when you come early. He writes your name down here. He writes down when you come a little late. He writes down when you come early, but you stay outside still talking with your friends because you want to come into church. You know, any longer than you really have to. Oh, it's so long. He writes that down. Oh, boy. Priests, holy priests have seen uh, angels come in church. Someone's looking out the window, daydreaming, thinking about my career during the liturgy. He writes your name down. He erases his name, and the person said, Oh, Lord, what's the right thing? Forgive me, Lord, for daydreaming. Erases their name. Comes communion time. The priest is giving communion, and the angel stands right next to him. And he says, I see you. And he's observing him. And now when they, he, they take communion, the angel puts gold or silver or bronze piece, or he takes away gold from the next guy, gives bronze to the next guy, takes away silver from the next guy, those who came worthily or unworthily, who were unprepared for communion, they lost grace. It was like damaging to their soul to come out for communion. They weren't prepared enough. I'll tell you later how to be prepared for communion. Fifteen, when becoming orthodox, Holy Confession on a regular basis and Holy Communion. That means that if you have something heavy in your heart, go to confession. If, you know, you feel you're still okay, you didn't have any sins, you are sinless. There's no need to come. Basically, heavy sins. And make sure you come prepared to say things. The priest isn't going to tell you your sins. We won't do that. But it's for you to come up and maybe just say one thing. I cursed. I was angry. I judged. I lacked love last week. Uh, I condemned someone. I slandered. I gossiped. I was lazy. Breaking the fast is not a sin. But the same thing, you have to ask yourself, why would you want to break the fast? If it's a means to come closer to Christ. So Jesus says, and when you fast, not if you like to fast, but if you fail, which I'm king of failing in the past, we go to confession. I broke the fast, um, intentionally, or I forgot I ate a burger, and it was Wednesday. I confess that. And every time you confess, the sins are erased. Elder Frem says, like pushing the delete button on the computer, you're gone. That's why the devil hates the sacrament of holy confession so much, because it's the easiest way to get into the kingdom of heaven. And once you receive absolution, know that you've been given the grace and granted forgiveness by God. Don't let the devil start whispering in your ear. I can't forgive you of these sins. You're a wretch. And you'll always be a wretch. No, you're forgiven. So after you have communion, no chewing bubblegum again, spitting or smoking. Just after receiving communion, you let it become you. But we drink tea after communion. You know, that's good. Go home and do that. You know, wait. Uh, chewing bubble gum, why can't you chew bubble gum? Because particles stick on your on your gum and you throw it out. The squirrel comes along, chews it. He's chewing bubble gum for the rest of his life. Okay, Seventeen. Abstain from food and drink. From midnight until after liturgy. So 12 on until after liturgy. So if we have the fastest liturgy, I think, in all the West here. It's amazing. I don't know how they go so long to figure that out one day. 18, picking a godfather and mother should be in good standing. So you want someone, if you're a female, you could just have a godmother. If you're a male, you could just have a godfather. Or if you're female, you can have a godfather and mother and the same thing with a male. But if they're single, godfather and mother, they can never marry. Okay. And if they're godparents to a goddaughter, and they're your godparents as well, a year after, you can't marry their goddaughter. Like that. You're spiritually bound to it's always good to have godparents that are married. Oh, the hard part is if this girl like this guy or this guy like this girl, and you pick them to be your godparents, one of them has to confess up. I kind of like John. 
kind of want to maybe marry him. Oh, really? So, okay. But make sure they're in good standing. You go to church. You want someone who's going to pray for you. And help save your soul. Godparents are responsible if the baby was born to the age of seven. By God. After that, he's free from any kind of a judgment by God. A godparent is not just him. Go to the ballpark and Chuck E. Cheese. And a godparent is one who comes and they actually assist the, the parents. And they bring the baby up to communion. And the parents have that much trust in the godparents that they will help the child to heaven by their prayers. Traditionally, the, the parents weren't even allowed in the, in the baptism. I believe that? They have full trust that they've chosen the godparents to take charge of my child and assist you in the upbringing of orthodoxy. And this can happen now along the way. You start, you know, don't start interviewing people. <laughs> but, you know, you know, you see who's here. Can you have a godparent in another church? Yes, you can. They can come here and be a sponsor. We say sponsor, a godparent. Uh, if you have them here, we're all family. We see each other. It's nice. I can help you with that and bless you. If you're ever looking in certain directions, I'll tell you it's available. 18. So. So anyone to be a godparent has to receive a blessing from them. Some may think they're in good standing in the church, and you may not know that they're not. And then I can talk to them about getting their act together. So. 20, finding a patron saint. St. Theophon the Recluse says, three days before, around three days after, whatever it is around that time of your baptism, look at the saints close to that. Look at the saints around three days around your birth date. Or there's one who's just really close to you that stands out. A life that you want to emulate. If your name is Barsanufius already, you might want to take St. Barsanufius. But if your name is Elton John, you might want to find a new name. You know what I mean? Elvis Presley. Did you believe this? We have a St. Conan in the church. And there's also an no unknown saint. He wouldn't give us his name. Because he was a barbarian before he became, lived a barbarous life, before he became Orthodox. So his name on the icon, he's a canonized saint. No name. They have to call him Saint uh, Barbarian. Or Barbarous. But Barbarian in English. So we have a Conan and a Barbarian. By right, you could be called Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> oh, that's a long thing. Okay. <laughs> so from now until baptism, you should be making out like a little diary. Don't let mom find it in your way. A little secret diary. Somehow, some way. Keep it private. I'll work on it in here and in here. Of your sins. From the age of seven on up. So from the age of first to seven years old, you do not have to go to confession. And fast. But at the age of seven, you start to introduce to them now. Confession, and I come up and say one little thing, barely, and start introducing fasting. Don't force anything on anyone. By all means, don't fast so much when you drive off the road, go down the, the gutter. Okay? Pace yourself. Patience, step by step. Barsam Rose says, take baby steps. Baby steps. So, again, you should be working confession and then. The night before you're baptized, God will you will not be you. You will come to the confessional, I'll put the soul of you. And you will say titles of sins. No long stories. I've done this. I beat up, you want to say I beat up Charlie? You want to say Charlie's name? Okay, say Charlie's name. But I've had six, seven fights. Father, I beat up seven people in my life. Don't tell me how much money you stole from the bank. Father, I stole from banks. 
the Father's not going to turn you in. I can use my soul. You're just not that worth I'm going to be greedy here. For me not to make it to heaven, and now to be with my wife and kids in heaven for all eternity. I won't dare tell anyone. But the grace of the church is whatever sins that come over here, the priest forgets it immediately. I can't remember anything. Any priest can tell you this. I can't remember your name when you come up for communion, let alone what you did 17 years ago on a Tuesday night for, for two minutes. I punch it, you know, Leroy in the nose. I'm not going to remember that. That's beautiful. But you have to say 100% of confession. So titles, hatred, uh, yes, fights, had many arguments. See? I've been drunk many times in my life. I've been, if you find that you're horrible to a particular person or two, you might want to say a little bit how you're horrible to that person. You deeply regret and are very sorry. The greatest confession of all, if you can, is to actually find a person out there, you know, that you might have offended greatly. There you go. I just, I just had to call you up and tell you the following text. It's all good. I'm really sorry. My, the way I treated you. If it's something like that. Um, you can't just go to confession after offending people. They say, make an effort, the saints say, to do this. Or God may not forgive you. Help people by easing their pain. You'd be surprised how much we offend people we don't know. You know. Um, and this corrects. It's a workshop here. It's ongoing confession. The Bible and the cross and the priest. That's why I don't do it by appointment. I'm there on Saturdays. I'm here during the week if you need to. And Sunday morning for emergency if you live far. You can't make Saturday. Or you miss Saturday for some party or something. Or something. Of course, we're here for you. Okay? Confession is not counseling. It's just confession of sins. If you want to have counseling later, I can talk with you and share with some holy fathers about a certain subject and what they advise. Okay? Okay, so, again, you in the true faith. I've had an exhausting life trying to find this place. And my family don't get it. A lot of my family members said, adios to me. Man will see a priest in a black robe in their house. Bye. I have no problem. Go for Jesus. I'm not going to give up. The kingdom of heaven, all the joys, where there's neither sickness or sorrow or suffering or pain, I'm not going to give up an indescribable place for all eternity for anti blah blah blah. Sorry. Be happy. Don't let people get on you. Because in ending here, your family might be the first to come at you. Your family members. And that's it. No need to fight back. I don't mean to say this, but I just want to give you that little warning. Hang there, because it's a battle to be baptized. Every time someone gets baptized, they always tell me these stories. Oh, Father, I don't know. If something happened, I might have to. This is happening. I don't know if I can make it. What do you mean? You have plans. People start telling me these things. Make a big sign of the cross. Say, oh, Lord, bless me to be baptized. Oh, Lord, help my situation. All right, so this concludes just the opening of Catechism. Next week we start on the Beatitudes of the Church. They're beautiful. And I'll read a paragraph, give an explanation for each one. It might take about seven weeks to get through that. And following that will be the Creed, which will include the seven sacraments. Okay. Any questions? How are we doing? Okay. All right. You have a question? Michael. Seven, there's an eighth one. Uh, people know, no, seven, but there were more. Uh, but that was a big factor with us in the schismatics, the, the Roman Catholics. So half my family's Catholic, you know. Uh, and I just, you do the research and you just go back to the first church, you know. But, uh, yeah, the Holy Fathers, Jesus Christ was like the rudder of a ship, and he 
steered them towards, steered them towards the truth. They, they were, and the seven pillars of the church, it talks about in Psalms, were the seven pillars that hold up the church. The ecumenical, seven ecumenical councils. Just like that. Okay. All right. We'll see you next week. Oh, yes. The next question. Jacob. Yeah, so no dairy products. So the biggie are no meat and dairy products, right? Um, wine is not permitted, you know, like all liquor during the time. <laughs> and uh, oil, olive oil. They say, oh, vegetable oil and all seed oils are okay, but that'll murder you anyway, physically. That's poison. So there's rice. And there's starchy, sugary foods. There's lentil soups. There's, you could just eat garbanzo bean. You could put lemon on it, put some herbs on it. You don't even know there's oil missing. With kidney beans and mix it, you know. Some Russian couple came. It was amazing. It was during Great Lent. They made a big, um, bowl was huge. Toss green salad. During Lent, it was like, mm, Paul Newman on that thing. Which is invisible. We didn't see any... Uh, salad dressing, but he used salt and pepper and herbs, and he mixed it and mixed it and added uh, red onion, tomatoes, and the really ripe tomatoes from his garden. We thought it was all salad dressing. We, we begged him, please, what's a salad dressing? We got to get the recipe. Just, there's nothing on it. It's just your imagination. And we had seconds. I felt like a turtle. <laughs> but it was amazing. Oh, uh, well, that's the point. Not giving your body what it wants. But don't become a miserable person. Hey, Jacob. Hello, Father. <laughs> My gosh. Maybe you should have something. You know, calm down. Uh, you know, that's not, you know, the whole purpose is to pray and fast. It's the journey to become holy and a more loving heart. See? But, and, hello, I'm fasting, everyone. We don't do that. And you see someone eating a cheeseburger? Your friend? <laughs> You know, don't calm down. Don't show them uh, that you notice the cheeseburger. Just don't judge. You know, and pray for him and pray for yourself and be merciful. A bishop went to a party and he saw meat and he said, "Oh Lord, please." He whispered the prayer, "Please turn this into potatoes." Oh, he didn't hear his prayer, so he had to eat the meat. It's best not to offend anyone. I'm preaching and teaching about Great Lent. I went to an Orthodox priest's church to visit him. And he had lamb for me on the first day of Great Lent. I went, <laughs> crying and eating. Lamb from an Orthodox priest. I thought I was safe. It's not the end of the world. Sometimes you're eating a burger and you forgot, oh my gosh, today's Wednesday. St. John Chrysostom says, the best part of fasting is to sh your mouth. We do so much damage to people that uh, we should fast from blah, blah, blah. You know, so we're fasting from movie theaters. You don't go to movie theaters. You don't go to a lot of things. And you know what? You're going to love that at the end of 40 days. You know, Brandon, you think you give up meat? <laughs> Brandon's a vegetarian, by the way. See, do we have any? Is there hope for us? Can we, can we endure 40 days and not eat meat? Do you think we'll be okay? Look at the biceps on this guy. There we go. There's lots of food out there. You guys, this isn't like 4th century where there's bread and barely finding bread. And that came from a raven to St. Elijah. Look at the raven behind. See the icon there? The raven's giving him bread. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we don't have a raven to give us, uh, you know, Lenten food. But. We got so much to choose from. It's just insane. And you don't want to be shopping all day for food. Get it, a system down, and then just put it in your pantry and have A, B, C, and D food. You don't need to have 20 different meals. You know, hang in there. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Tyler. Uh,
Okay, so rule 12 is to not shake your hands in the narthex as soon as you enter the church and in the church. St. Sam Soro said, when you're in church and someone wants to talk to you, just, just, just a little smile and bow your head up. It's just, and in return, just a little nod. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. It's like the Hello Hawaii Center. It's not a Hello Hawaii Center. He's just, you know, come into church and start praying. You might get one of those absolutely, hey, did I offend you? No, I was just, I was just praying. We have to learn. We have to be a little bold to, to stick to our teaching. But yeah, you know, you know, uh, first thing you do when you come into church is, you know, hey, I got to see how the hall looks. I hear we set it up differently. Don't be curious to see the whole how it looks. And even, uh, you know, in the church, there's so much going on. We're going to talk about that. But in the liturgy, and the cherubic hymn, and lay aside all earthly cares completely. But it's, before you enter the church, you should be crossing yourselves, saying a Jesus prayer, giving your heart ready to come worship God, and to make sure you're at peace with everyone before you enter. You come in. And, you, and you know, eventually you'll show how to venerate the icons when you come in, and then you go to your place. And after liturgy is done, I'm in the side consuming the holy gifts. I need silence. But the church should be, sh and they're doing prayers on you. Why aren't we listening to the prayers? See? So we stand like this, you know? So we're not supposed to lean on walls. We're not supposed to cross your legs in church. You know? Sorry about that, Eric. We're not supposed to be, uh, you know, just someone call me. Let me just see who it is. Let me just see who it is. Okay. Don't see who it is. Why isn't that person in church? Why doesn't that person know you're not in church? And uh, don't bring your phone. In the altar, St. John Maximovich says, no gadgets allowed. And that was in the 60s. It probably means a watch. Maybe a walkie-talkie. <laughs> I don't know what was there back then, but yeah. It's good for us to keep all this stuff up. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, God bless. We'll see you next week for some real serious teachings. Okay? All right, God bless you. Um,